uh, that are going clinical trials, just so you get an idea where Irvine is Irvine, California. This is California and Irvine is in southern part of California. It's very close to Los Angeles. It's uh, about maybe 45 minutes from Los Angeles. And this is where Disneyland is, um, in case uh, you know where that is. Okay, so pathophysiology of migraine involves this baseline hypersensitivity of the brain. Um, there are a lot of neurotransmitters involved with the uh, uh, migraine Professor, process. sorry for interruption, but if uh, I hear the sound a little bit soft, so... Okay, is this better? Is this stronger? Yeah, better, better, much better like this. Okay. Thank you, Professor. All right, I'll hold it over here. So um, the neurotransmitters involved include glutamate, uh, serotonin, histamine, uh, and calcitonin gene-related protein. And you can see this is a uh, nucleus in the vestibular uh, nucleus. I'm sorry, it's a neuron in the vestibular nucleus. And you can see all of the various neurotransmitters that act on that single uh, neuron. So there is, there is a lot of things that are involved with our central balance pathways. What starts out initially is a spreading cortical depression. There's some kind of biochemical change in the brain that leads to a decrease in electrical activity. That decrease in electrical activity then tends to spread in the brain. And it's kind of like a seizure, but the opposite of a seizure. So a seizure is an increase in activity that spreads. And a migraine is a decrease in activity that spreads. That then leads to activation of the trigeminal nerve, which then leads to the, the primary symptom of migraine that we often see is headache. But there are a lot of other things that we see related to the ear, and that those are changes that affect the inner ear directly, and then the central vestibular effect that um, we also see, and we'll talk about these as we go on. So the trigeminal nerve is intimately involved with the ear. So this was an experiment that was done uh, by Fred Nadal uh, back about maybe 20 years ago. And they, what they looked at is they labeled the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve. So this is the trigeminal nerve, this is the ophthalmic branch. They, they labeled this and then looked to see where they would see the label go. So they, you could see where all the nerve fibers from the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerves go. And it went to the basilar artery, the ICA, uh, the spiral modular artery, and all the way inside the cochlea, this is the spiral modular artery. And you can see that there are nerve fibers all around uh, those vessels. And then even in the striovascularis, there is a tremendous number of trigeminal nerve uh, fibers that are innervating the, the stria vascularis. So the same group, what they did was they stimulated the trigeminal nerve uh, with electrical stimulation at various uh, degrees and wanted to see how much, what happens inside the cochlea. So this is what happened when they didn't do any stimulation. This is what happened when they did 0.1 milliamp of stimulation. And you can see that there is a much more uh, fluid extravasation within the cochlea. So they looked at how much fluid came out of the blood vessels inside the cochlea. And the more stimulation you gave, the more fluid came out of the cochlea, out of the blood vessels into the cochlea. So these changes from trigeminal nerve stimulation can theoretically cause a lot of the things that we see in the inner ear, including endolymphatic high drops, Meniere's disease, uh, benign positional vertigo, et cetera. So in the general population, migraine is relatively common. It, it depends on the population, but somewhere between 30, 13 to 25% of the population has had uh, or actively has migraine problems. Now, of those, approximately 30 to 40% of the people will get vertigo. So that means that about 3 to 5% of the general population gets migraine-related vertigo. So they get vestibular migraine. Now, when you look at that number versus the Meniere's disease prevalence, so Meniere's 
prevalence, at least in the United States, is about 0.2% or two out of a thousand people. So if you look at that ratio, for every approximately 20 patients with vestibular migraine, you should see one patient with Meniere's disease. So if you're diagnosing 90% of your dizzy patients with Meniere's disease, um, then you're probably overdiagnosing it. And most likely a lot of those patients have vestibular migraine. Now, a lot of patients with vestibular migraine get vertigo without any headaches at the same time or even some in their history. So sometimes you can have a migraine with no headache and just have vertigo as the only uh, sign of the, the migraine. And a lot of symptoms of atypical migraine involve the ear. Um, the, the most common areas we see are uh, the ear and the eye, basically. And the ear is probably much more common than the eye is. Now, um, patients who get atypical migraine, uh, a lot of them don't fulfill the International Headache Society criteria. And I always say that, remember that International Headache Society criteria or other criteria for migraine are criteria that were really made by people. So these were not, this is not something that was written in stone. This is something that people got together and decided this is what we're gonna set as criteria for migraine headaches. It doesn't mean that if people have symptoms that are slightly outside of that, do not have migraine. I, I sort of liken this to laws. So if there is a law that's passed and then five years later, the circumstances change and then they change the law, uh, it basically means that the, the, the way that the law was written before was probably not correct and it has to be revised. And I think the criteria for International Headache Society really need to be revised to include other things. But for now, we have to kind of live with what, what's there. But keep in mind, a lot of people have migraine and do not fulfill the regular migraine headache criteria that, that everyone associates with it. Now, other um, types of symptoms that people with atypical migraine get are the non-severe headaches that a lot of people will call um, sinus headaches, or they say they get pain behind their eyes, or they say they have pain when they uh, move their eyes. They sometimes say, well, I don't get migraine. I just get stress headaches or I just get caffeine headaches, um, or I have uh, just pressure in my head. I don't have a headache, I just have pressure in my head. And these are all forms of migraine. They're just very small forms of migraine. So there are just different degrees of it. Some people get milder symptoms and some people get severe symptoms. And the severe symptoms are the ones we traditionally think of migraine, but the mild symptoms are also part of the migraine. It's just a spectrum. Now there are people who say that um, I get sinusitis if, I, if air conditioning hits my face, um, or when there are weather changes, I get migraine, um, or I get headaches. Um, keep in mind that you cannot get sinusitis from air conditioning. You can get a migraine from air conditioning, but not a sinus infection. So um, that is something that if you hear these things, think migraine before you think anything else. People who say that they get dizziness with weather changes, they say, oftentimes I get my dizziness in the spring when the rain starts um, or in the fall with other symptoms. So that weather changes because of atmospheric pressure changes, that's actually what leads to the migraine rather than uh, it change necessarily in uh, the uh, allergens and things like that. You might see this where people say, I've had several sinus surgeries, but I still get the sinus pain, oftentimes in the forehead. And you look at their CT scan and it's a completely drilled out uh, frontal sinus. And then you wonder where are they getting sinus uh, pain? And the reason is because they didn't have sinus infection to begin with. Um, they had a migraine probably to begin with. And a lot of times patients will say that they had surgery and then their pain got better after, for a few months after the sinus surgery, and then the pain started again. And so they say, well, the sinus surgery worked because my pain got better. Well, the reason the sinus surgery works in a situation like that is because the sinus surgery just goes and removes a lot of nerve endings as part of the process. 
when you remove the nerve endings, there is relief of the pain. Then the nerve endings all grow back and then the pain starts. So the problem isn't a sinus infection, but rather uh, a migraine problem. So be on the lookout for people who say, I have this, or they say, I, I touch my face and it hurts um, because those are symptoms are of migraine oftentimes and not sinusitis. And you know, if somebody has very mild disease on a CT scan, that doesn't mean that they have sinus infection and pain from that. It probably is a migraine. Think migraine before anything else. So what triggers a migraine? So migraine, of course, is a genetic problem. And it's a, it's a gene that's in actually a lot of people, but a lot of people don't necessarily show the symptoms. And that's because the, the reason they don't get symptoms is because the environmental circumstances are not such that they, they will develop symptoms. But the environmental uh, factors that lead up to migraine include stress, uh, which uh, could be psychological stress, most commonly it's psychological stress, and includes things like anxiety, being upset at somebody, somebody dies in the family, or it could be physical stress. So uh, you have back pain, you have a, a cold, those are all stressors for the brain. And the brain reacts in the same way as it does with when being you're upset or if you have pain in your foot. The brain sees everything the same way, acts the same way, and therefore you will get the migraine in the same way that you can get from physical versus psychological stress. A lot of times you'll see hormonal changes around menopause most frequently um, be the cause of migraine symptoms. And that's probably the reason a lot of the... Uh, patients we see with vertigo are women around the age of 50 because that's generally the age of uh, menopause. We could see it with the menstrual cycle when people are younger. We see it with hormone replacement therapy, um, oral contraceptives. And in men, uncommonly, we do see it with testosterone supplements. These are people who are using uh, testosterone on a daily uh, basis. Now, a lot of times patients will say, when I was younger and I would get headaches around my menstrual cycle, but um, now I'm 50, I don't get any headaches anymore. I just get the dizziness, and that's because of the changes from menopause. Other things we see are that are migraine triggers are changes in sleep. So somebody sleeps too much. Um, that's people who are oversleep or they nap um, every day or irregularly. People who sleep too little, they have an interrupted sleep, they have a lot of awakenings at night, or they have obstructive sleep apnea. People who have a shifting sleep schedule, some weeks they work days and some weeks they work nights, or they, um, they, people who are uh, traveling a lot and have a, a change in their hours, uh, time zones. Or people who tend to wake up early on weekdays and then on weekends, we'll sleep in and sleep late. And that kind of shifting of your sleep schedule is very stressful for the brain. And that will then lead to migraine. So as part of fixing this, we have to fix, uh, fixing migraine, we have to fix the sleep. Head trauma can sometimes trigger it in intracranial surgery, um, uh, which is essentially like head trauma and any kind of blood within the system or the shock of a head trauma. Uh, in surgery, a lot of times we see it after surgery, a lot of times surgery in the head and neck, and a lot of times dental work. Anything that stimulates the trigeminal nerve could lead up to a migraine, and that migraine could then lead to vertigo or other ear symptoms. Other things we see are diet, um, like people who skip meals or get dehydrated. Um, I'm sure you see it probably during Ramadan a lot. Um, I certainly see it here uh, in, in patients who fast. Um, there are certain foods that can trigger migraine, and those are foods that tend to have a neurotransmitter or something that, that looks very much like a neurotransmitter within, within the food. And most common foods that we see, probably the most common is caffeine. Other things are chocolate, nuts, um, alcohol, uh, cheeses, uh, breads, uh, especially the fresh bread. Um, any kind of um, protein that is sits around a long time, like it's in a can or it's aged, um, the uh, neurotransmitter glutamate is involved with migraine and monosodium glutamate or MSG, 
which is a preservative in a lot of foods, prepackaged ready to eat foods or pickled fruits. Uh, MSG is a major trigger for migraines. So after caffeine, MSG is probably the most common trigger. Um, and then other things that we see sometimes certain types of fruits and vegetables, uh, bananas, uh, citrus fruit, any overly ripened fruit. So I tell patients that a, um, for example, a pear that's hard, it will not uh, cause migraine, but a very soft pear that's got turned a little bit brown, that will cause migraine because uh, the protein in the uh, fruit will break down and the tyrosine becomes tyramine. And that tyramine um, is what actually the trigger is in migraine. Other triggers that we see are intense stimulations. Um, headaches can oftentimes be uh, triggered by bright lights or loud sounds, but sometimes we see vertigo that gets triggered by loud sounds. Um, it sometimes looks very similar to perilymphistula and superior canal dehiscence. Um, you can get sometimes uh, problems that look very much, or people who've had surgery for these conditions, and when you actually see the patient, you realize that the patient has really a migraine problem and not the other conditions. Um, vertigo tends to be most commonly triggered by in a lot of repeated head motions or certain types of head motions. And the most common one is looking up. So these are patients, they say, when I look up, that makes me dizzy. Um, or I turn a certain way. And these are patients who don't have benign positional vertigo. Now, other things that you see are uh, people with visual motion sensitivity. So when they look at things that move a lot, like a computer screen, or people who walk with their phone and scroll and read at the same time, those are things that will cause people to be dizzy. Changes in weather, as I said, related to atmospheric pressure. Sometimes people say, I can tell when there's a storm coming, there's gonna be rain. Um, uh, people sometimes can be uh, uh, triggered by intense smells, heat, Sometimes the cold air blowing on the face or in the ear, um, people who get ear pain from cold air going in their ear, those are migraine patients. Um, or sometimes intense exercise in some people is a trigger. So think of migraine, people who say um, they can't go outside without sunglasses. They always have to have sunglasses. It's, it's so bothersome. Even when it's cloudy, they have to wear glasses. People who are just a little bit of noise, like traffic or cell phone, bothers them. They say, I can't talk on the cell phone anymore because the sound bothers my ear. Sensitivity to motion in the visual field is most commonly the computer screen, as I was talking about. But sometimes even they say that the windshield wipers on my car or a ceiling fan, something just moves in the periphery of the vision can trigger it. Uh, people who go to three-dimensional movies and they say they get dizzy or they get headaches, those are migraine sufferers. People who have had a history of childhood motion sickness or start developing motion sickness as an adult, those are again migraine patients. Um, sometimes patients describe the space and motion discomfort where they say when they go from an, an inside of a building, they go outside or they go from an outside to a smaller space, that can sometimes make them dizzy. Um, and or sometimes patients who say they have excessive nausea, they just are nauseated all the time. Um, they say, I don't get dizzy. It's just, I feel nausea. Those patients, of course, we send to GI doctors to rule out anything else, but um, assuming everything else is normal, migraine is a lot of times the culprit. Um, so one of the things that um, we see very commonly with migraine is ear pain or ear pressure. Um, now, of course, you have to rule out any other causes, um, but it could be associated with headache wind in the ear or uh, dizziness. Um, people who have an ear pressure that doesn't resolve with popping their ears. They try to pop their ears, it doesn't get better. Um, and, or you do a myringotomy and their, their ear pressure doesn't get better. And you've checked to make sure they don't have superior canal dehiscence. If all of those are checked um, and they have this ear pressure, then they have most likely a migraine related problem. Um, people who say they have sinus headache with repeated CT scans that, are, that look normal or very minimal findings, um, and they don't respond to treatment. Now, sometimes patients say, when I take a decongestant, that helps me, so I know that it's a migraine problem. But really, a decongestant is, uh, I'm sorry, they say that I know it's a sinusitis problem, but it, the decongestant is really helping the migraine problem because it causes 
vascular uh, spasm. Low frequency or fluctuating hearing loss is another uh, condition that's associated with migraine. Um, if you think somebody has Meniere's disease, they most likely have migraine. And uh, we'll talk about all of these conditions a little bit more. Think of migraine, as I said, with people with dizziness with loud noise and they don't have superior canal deacens or they don't have a history associated with perilymph fistula. Patients who have recurrent benign positional vertigo that does not respond to Epley maneuver and they have a normal MRI. If patient has vertigo and their MRI is negative and they don't have benign positional vertigo, most likely they have uh, migraine as the cause. Dick's hall pike sometimes can cause them to be dizzy, but they don't have nystagmus. Again, think migraine. Um, people who have severe nausea or vomiting after an Epley maneuver or after Dick's hall pike, think of migraine. Um, immediate nystagmus on Dick's hall pike. So these are people you lie back and there's no delay. They start having nystagmus, think migraine again. Now, sometimes people say, well, why am I getting this um, now and why, am I, why didn't I get it before? And the way I describe it is there's a threshold in our brain where once the brain activity reaches that threshold, you will start getting migraine symptoms. So it can start with stress and a little bit of hormonal changes and then poor sleep, et cetera. And then a little bit of diet sort of, all these factors are cumulative, they'll add to each other. And then they reach a point where then the, it goes above the threshold. Once you're above threshold, the symptoms will start. And then once you go below the threshold, then the symptoms will, will stop. So patients will get symptoms one day and then they're okay for another day and then the symptoms come back. And what we usually say is that what we like to do is basically get the brain activity come down to where it used to be, where if you had any kind of food item, you wouldn't get triggered. So the patients sometimes say, why am I getting symptoms now? And I didn't before. And so why do I have to watch my diet? And this is the reason. Now, people can sometimes have continuous migraine. So you can have symptoms, the migraine activity increases, it reaches the threshold, they'll have symptoms. And then little factors like diet or poor sleep or sleep apnea or stress will continue the condition. Sometimes having the condition is very stressful and can continue the problem. Now, um, some people have my, multiple migraine thresholds. So there are people who have a headache threshold and the headache threshold is um, when you have, uh, they were younger, they were getting headaches, but then now they're older, their brain activity has gone further and now they're reaching their uh, vertigo threshold. But then sometimes you do things, you treat them um, and they get better and the vertigo gets better, but the headache doesn't. And that's, that's the reason. Or sometimes the headache is above the vertigo, so their headaches get better, but their vertigo doesn't. That just means you just have to work a little bit harder at, at, at getting the patient better. Prophylactic medications elevate these thresholds. So if you are here and you elevate this threshold, then the, the activity is below threshold, then you'll, they'll, they'll have no symptoms. Trigger control, which is really the best way to treat migraine, is what brings the brain activity back to its baseline so then they have no symptoms. So this is what prophylactic medications do. It makes the threshold up, the symptoms will go away, um, but trigger control is really the best way to do this naturally. Now, we actually looked at um, Meniere's, Prosper Meniere's original four papers. He wrote about uh, this disease. Now, keep in mind that Meniere's disease did not get named for Meniere until after Meniere was actually uh, passed away. So he had died and they said, oh, this condition he was describing, we'll call it Meniere's disease. Now, and we looked at his original papers in French, and um, we wrote a paper about actually the translation of it and looking specifically for migraine. And uh, Meniere himself said all of the patients he described had migraine. Um, and he said that he said, we believe that it can be asserted that many so-called migraines uh, and he's talking about the patient symptoms, are only the index of a morbid process leading to deafness. So he said that it, they had migraine, and then later they were getting deafness. He just didn't connect the fact that migraine can cause deafness and migraine can cause the vertigo. But he said all of his patients had migraine. Um, it's unfortunately, after people talk about this later, 
no one realized that many years had talked about migraine, and so migraine got forgotten for um, almost 150 years until we looked at it again. So we started looking at Meniere's disease patients and looked at a cohort of 28 patients with definite Meniere's disease. And these patients, um, we looked at 68% of them fulfilled the criteria for migraine headaches. The other 32% had either a family history of migraine in their first degree relative, like mother, father, uh, brother, sister, or children, uh, or they had migraine features or three of the sensitivities, so it's sensitive to light, sound, motion, et cetera. Then we looked at Meniere's disease patients that we treated with migraine medications. So we took a cohort of 26 definite Meniere's patients. We treated them just using migraine medications. Uh, and these are patients who had all taken uh, a diuretic before. They had all taken uh, uh, hydrochlorothiazide triamterine before. And we treated them with either nortriptyline or verapamil, and then we added topiramate later if necessary. We did a quality of life survey at the beginning and the end, and 92% of them had a significant improvement in quality of life, and the average number of episodes per month went from 8 to 0 0.6. And patients, we found, basically respond very well to migraine medications, many years of these patients. And the response that we found is equivalent to a vestibular nerve section. So this is from our paper. And this is our, our group. <clears throat> we had 92% improvement. The only thing that came at, close to that was the, the, the old papers with vestibular nerve section where they got between 90 and 94. The one, only other ones that, that have been um, uh, with that, those numbers have been intratympanic uh, gentamicin, which I almost never do for uh, many years to see because the migraine prophylaxis works so well for this problem. Now, we started looking at other conditions that are uh, potentially caused by migraine and treated them as vestibular migraine to see how they do. So we started with a group of patients with mal de debarkman. And as you know, mal de debarkman are patients who come off a boat or a, um, an airplane and they have a persistent sensation of dizziness. They feel they're still on a boat. Um, and so those patients we treated with the migraine protocol we had a group of patients in the past that we used to send to physical therapy, um, and most of the patients were female, and the average age was 51, which is generally where we see a lot of uh, women with uh, migraine and vertigo and other uh, symptoms related to migraine present. The patient's symptoms went from a scale of 0 to 10, it was average of 7.6 to an average of 1.8. The control group had some improvement, but not much. But when we treated them with migraine, they had much better improvement um, with a good follow-up period. And some of the characteristics of these patients included motion sickness that was in 67% of the patients. Uh, patients who 87% uh, of the patients had a history of sinus pain, facial pressure, headache, or uh, wind, air, exposed to wind or air conditioner. This, again, a migraine-related migraine condition, 87% of them had it. But when we looked at how many fulfilled International Headache Society, 73% did. Okay. Then we looked at hyperacusis, um, and we treated patients with hyperacusis with our migraine protocol. We had uh, some historical controls that we treated with broadband noise sound therapy. In the migraine group, we did not give them sound therapy. And then we looked at this um, scoring system that was developed by Khalfa, and the normal is less than 27. The treatment group went from 32.6 to 22, so they became normal. The control group improved, but not as much as we saw improvement in the treatment group. Then we started looking at um, ear pressure. These are patients who come in, as I said, that feel like they have pressure, a sensation in their ear or plugging. Um, we had, uh, these are 54% of them had migraine. Their symptoms went from an average of 7.2 to 1.5, so almost no symptoms. And 91% of these patients had visual motion sensitivity. So they had an ear pressure problem, but they said if they look at a big screen TV that moves a lot, it makes them uh, uncomfortable. 
In pediatric dizziness, I just wanted to tell you about pediatric dizziness a little bit. Um, pediatric dizziness, if the patient has a normal MRI, they probably have a migraine problem. And the best way to treat them is not with medications, but rather with uh, control of their triggers, which is diet and sleep uh, primarily. Now, this is a patient that we reported in the past year where we looked at a patient with a five-year-old with Meniere's disease. Um, and this is the normal hearing. This is their Meniere side. This hearing had been down for six months and the patient had three to four episodes a week of vertigo. And all we did was just did diet control and sleep control. They sleep the same schedule every day, um, drink lots of water, and they, we give them magnesium and vitamin B2, uh, riboflavin. And this is a patient that came back about six weeks later. His hearing was almost back to normal and um, no more episodes of vertigo. And this patient's now over a year out and fortunately has, has had no problems. But we tell the patients, you still have to be careful because this can come back. Now, um, we looked at patients who are post stapedectomy and have persistent vertigo. Um, we had five patients, some of whom, had, most of whom had actually been referred to us from other places um, for possible revision surgery. But when we talked to these patients, the, pa the patient really had a vertigo problem uh, related to migraine and not the stapedectomy. Stapedectomy can induce a migraine problem. Now, do, you, do we just do that? No, we, we will um, first do a blood patch, which we draw blood, inject it in the ear. Um, they, ha they lie there for 30 minutes. If their symptoms get better, then we can tell that there's probably a perilum fistula. If it doesn't, then we know that there's something else. We get a CT scan to make sure they don't have a long prosthesis. We get an MRI to make sure they don't have a tumor. Uh, but once all those are ruled out, the patient's treated with migraine prophylaxis and all of them improved. In fact, one of them went off medication about six months later and her symptoms came back. We put her back on and her symptoms went away. Now, migraine and hearing loss is actually is a lot of times people say, well, yeah, migraine can cause vertigo, but it doesn't cause hearing loss. Well, I'm, I'm here to tell you that migraine causes hearing loss. Um, and uh, this is based on evidence that has actually been around for a long time. It's just that a lot of times we don't, uh, if you're not looking for it, you don't see it. Now, this was a group of uh, 45,000 patients with migraine. Um, versus 180,000 controls. This was a study done in Korea, and they, they saw that migraine patients were 50% more likely to get sudden hearing loss. Um, and then another study um, came out that looked at 10,000 migraine patients versus 41,000 control patients, and the migraine patients had 80% higher chance of developing sudden hearing loss. Now, this was a paper from 1987 talking about a patient with recurrent sudden hearing loss with migraine headaches. Now, if you start asking your sudden hearing loss patients about headaches, you will discover that a lot of them have had headaches right before or around the time of their sudden hearing loss. Not all of them, but a lot of them. So um, maybe about, I think, two years ago or so, there is a, a paper that came out of Taiwan uh, where they described this phenomenon of cochlear migraine, something that actually we had seen for many years and we were treating, but they actually were the ones who named it. Um, this is patients who they described as having low frequency, recurrent hearing loss, um, and but no dizziness. They had family history of migraine, uh, stiffness of the neck a lot of times on the same side. They, know, they may have headaches, but they a lot of times have neck stiffness, which is just another form of the migraine. A lot of them have motion intolerance or sensitivity to pressure changes. And this was our sort of paper we wrote about it as well. Now, we started maybe about two years ago treating patients with sudden hearing loss with migraine medications in addition to steroids. So we give all patients oral and intratympanic steroids. Um, but starting about two years ago, we started treating patients also with migraine prophylactic medications. And specifically, we give them nortriptyline plus topiramates to start. And then we add verapamil sometimes if there isn't a response. And what we found is that this is the, the group that was previously was just treated. This is the average improvement in hearing. And these are patients who have at least a 30 decibel 
uh, sudden loss in three frequencies. So it's a significant hearing loss. We're not talking small hearing loss, uh, sudden losses. The patients who got migraine prophylaxis, uh, in addition to steroids, got a much better outcome in the low frequencies. So you can see on average is about 10 to 15 decibels better between 250 and 1000 hertz. Here's an example of a patient. This is a patient who came in who had intratympanic and oral steroids done outside by another uh, uh, physician. The patient um, had uh, this sudden loss to begin with. They came to us, this is when, when the patient showed up to us and had, this is the level of their hearing, was essentially the same as this. Their ward understanding was zero. She, she, all she heard was she said, she just heard something in the ear, no, no sound. All we did was give her nortriptyline and topiramate. And then we saw her about five or six weeks later. And this is on nortriptyline, 75 milligrams, and topiramate, 150 milligrams. And you can see that the low frequencies have improved substantially to the normal range. The higher frequencies have improved. And her ward understanding is now at uh, 100% in that ear. So this went from a dead ear, completely useless ear, to an ear where you can use a hearing aid, and this patient is currently using a hearing aid in that ear. So we started looking at um, patients with long-term sudden hearing loss. These are patients who are six months out from the onset of sudden hearing loss. So everyone has always said, if you get to the patient after two weeks, um, or you get patient after four weeks, then there's nothing to do, and most people don't treat it at that point. And because we had such success with treating sudden hearing loss with migraine medications, we said, well, let's see if we can get these patients with chronic sudden hearing loss better. Now, these patients a lot of times had fullness in the ear or they still had headaches. And we started them on nortriptyline, starting at 25 milligrams. And then every two weeks, we would go up by 25. And we gave them topiramate at the same time, starting at 25 milligrams and going up by 25 every week. So this would be a six-week course of medication. If they didn't get better, we gave them two intratympanic steroid injections separated by three days. 14% of them returned to normal. Um, this is, they returned to back where their hearing is on the other side. These are people who had had six months of hearing loss. Um, and their ward discrimination improvement of more than 15%. Yes. Um, more than 15% was seen in 54% of the patients. The mean improvement in ward discrimination was 35%, and 33% of the patients went from non-usable hearing to usable hearing where they could actually use a hearing aid. This is an example of a patient. This is the patient who had this hearing loss. Uh, the audiogram is from June. Um, maybe mute your microphone. Someone, someone is, uh, sound is in the background. Um, the, this is the word discrimination was 32%. This is when the patient came to us three months later, had the same hearing and 32% word understanding with our hearing test. And this is where with the patient on nortriptyline, uh, 25 milligram and topiramate 50 milligram. You can see the low frequencies have improved and the word understanding is now 80%. And now the patient was using a hearing aid. So how do we treat migraines? Lifestyle changes are probably the best way to start. You want to strictly adhere to the diet. Um, you want to eliminate the diet, everything on the diet that's bad, and then you add them later. We tell patients to don't skip meals, drink lots of water during the day, but not until, no, no water after uh, three hours before bedtime, because we don't want them to wake up multiple times. Waking up multiple times in the night is not good. And I would uh, tell your patients that don't to not fast if they have vertigo from migraine because i tell patients that i usually joke with them i say i will vouch for you in front of god i say i told them not to fast but if if you have vertigo and you're getting it from migraine and it's because you're hungry or or dehydrated then uh, I, you know the fast is really is, is causing a quality of life problem Sleep uh, the same schedule every day. We, um, if there's any suggestion on the anatomy, we will get a sleep study. Um, or if they snore, I'll get a sleep study. Uh, I tell patients to do exercise and meditation relaxation. 
every patient with migraine gives, gets vitamin B2 or riboflavin, 200 milligrams twice a day, and magnesium, uh, either magnesium oxide or glycinate, 400 milligrams twice a day. Medications that we use um, are mostly preventative medications. We generally don't use abortive medications. Um, so I generally don't use triptan like Imitrex or Sumatriptan. Um, but if you're going to use it, that's, the, that's what I use. I generally use it for headaches. Um, prednisone is probably one of the best uh, migraine uh, abortives. And that's probably why prednisone works so well for vertigo. These are patients that you give them um, a course and they say, I got better. And sometimes people associate it with an autoimmune condition. They say, oh, it must be autoimmune because the prednisone is helping. But it's because prednisone is helping the migraine. Um, so prophylactic medication um, is really the way to go. And I generally don't use vestibular suppressant like meclizine. Um, or an, other antihistamines, but sometimes meclizine does help in patients who are very sensitive to histamine. And histamine is in a lot of fruits, uh, like uh, oranges and things like that, lemons, uh, so and nuts, uh, you know, almonds have a lot of histamine. So if you if you have patients who say they have they get dizzy with those, meclizine would be an option. I generally use only suppressants for people who are going to go on a ship or on an uh, airplane. Really nobody understands why migraine med medications work, but they generally all work about 70 to 80% of the time. There's really nothing that's 100%. It takes time for them to work because we have to start at a low dose and gradually go up on the dose. Um, and there's really some art to the management of this. It's not like the diuretic, you just give them one pill, they take and that's it. You have to kind of manage the medicine, go up, go down a little bit based on symptoms. The most common medication I use is nortriptyline. It's a tricyclic antidepressant. You could use other ones, but that's the one I use the most commonly. Um, it can make people sleepy, so you, you start it at night. Um, rarely people can get energy from it, so we do it in the morning sometimes. We start at 25 and gradually increase every two to three weeks by 25 to, to um, 75. If not improved at 75, I generally don't go up higher. Um, some people may be sensitive to medications or they're, they're uh, thinner. Um, we'll start them at five or 10 milligrams. If somebody has an arrhythmia history, then it's good to see a cardiologist or get an EKG. We will check for the QT interval. Um, if prolonged QT is, is the only thing that we need to uh, check. And if, if we're gonna keep patients on 75 milligrams um, long-term, we get an EKG to check for the QT interval. Um, Amitriptyline causes a little bit more sleepiness, but the dosing is the same. We don't use it if people are on high-dose antidepressants or they have an unknown arrhythmia type that we can't uh, decipher. SSRIs like paroxetine uh, is uh, the one that I use the most commonly. Are people who have cardiac issues, so we can't use nortriptyline, um, or they have a lot of rhythm, uh, heart rhythm affecting agents. Um, we it can cause sleepiness in some people and wakefulness in some people. So I tell them, take it in the morning. If you get sleepy, then change it to the night. I usually start them at five milligrams and every two weeks we'll increase it up to 30 milligrams. Um, if somebody's on high dose antidepressants, I generally don't use it. Calcium channel blockers, most common one I use is verapamil. I found verapamil to work better than amlodipine. Um, nobody knows why it works, but it might be a vasoactive uh, phenomenon. I generally start at 120 milligrams, and every two weeks will increase by 60. Now, uh, you have to use the sustained release formula so that the, because the sustained release formula is the one that's going to last for 24 hours. Um, it takes a couple of weeks to work. You, this is the dosage. Sometimes I'll start in lower if somebody has a systolic blood pressure of less than 95 or a heart rate of less than 60, then we'll start them at a, at a low dose. The alternative is candesartan, which is a um, angiotensin blocker. We start at 4 milligrams and go up to 32. Candesartan does not lower the heart rate, so if somebody has high blood pressure but a low heart rate, then candesartan is a very good option. 
anticonvulsants, um, they it's thought that they may raise the threshold um, for the depression. It just basically it prevents the spread of that depression. As I said, it's like seizures essentially. Uh, the one most common one I use is topiramate, uh, starting at 12, 25 milligrams and go up to 150 milligrams. I go up once a week uh, on symptom. Uh, gabapentin is another one that I use. I start usually very low at around 100 milligrams and go all the way up to 300 um, TID. And every week or, or, or a couple of weeks, I'll go up. Um, this is page, good for patients who have multiple cardiac medications. Um, or issues and you don't want anything that's going to affect the heart, heart rate, blood pressure, um, the rhythm, etc. Alternative to this is acetazolamide or Diamox. Um, and so I use this, this regimen starting at 250 milligrams. I don't use beta blockers too much, but um, sometimes when I use it, I use propranolol um, at, at 80 milligrams, uh, the long acting version. It's best to use a medication that's a once a day medicine because patients, uh, you want some to make it easy. Just take it once a day. I tell them to take it at bedtime so they don't forget uh, to take it. Um, if it's ineffective, you keep going up. Um, you can use um, metoprolol or atenolol. Um, uh, the general side effects are the really lowered heart rate and orthostatic hypotension. Someone who has asthma or significant diabetes, you want to avoid those. So if somebody has sleep or anxiety issues, then I give them uh, nortriptyline. If they have hypertension and really no sleep or anxiety issues, I'll start with verapamil. We, we go up until they get better. So I say, you go up, you take it for two weeks. If you get better, you stay there. If you don't get better, you go to the next dose. Not better, you go to the next dose. If you get better, you stay wherever you are. I generally tell patients we're not aiming to completely make all symptoms go away. Because if they are working on their triggers, that's really what has to be the way to make things go away. Control triggers and use prophylactic medication so we can get the brain activity below the, the threshold. Once the patient's symptoms become intermittent, I tell them, look for your, what happened six hours before your symptoms started. So I say, if you're doing fine and then suddenly you get vertigo at three in the afternoon, then look back six hours. What happened in the six hours that caused this? Did you go hungry? Did you go thirsty? Um, did you eat something? Usually something that they would have eaten at lunch probably. Um, or did you have stress or something like that? So generally speaking, it's going to be those four or five triggers, stress, sleep, diet. And the diet has dehydration, hunger, and food items. Um, if patients have a lot of cardiac medications, I usually start them on paroxetine um, or uh, topiramate. Um, we continue the treatment generally for three months where they have essentially very minimal symptoms or no symptoms, and they can identify their triggers, and then we take them off the medication. Rarely, patients need medication long-term because they have a significant anxiety problem, and they just need to be on medication for that. And so we will put them on something that controls the anxiety, and then it also controls their migraine. Now, um, I generally don't do uh, surgery for uh, Meniere's disease. If we have to, we will do it, but it's very, very rare. Maybe once every couple of years, we have to do an endolymphatic sac surgery. But one thing I do use um, often is intratympanic steroids and tympanostomy tubes. And the tympanostomy tubes I only use for people who have pressure-induced symptoms. And these are low pressure. They say, whenever I go on an airplane, I get vertigo or whenever it's cloudy or rainy, or I go to a mountain, I get, I get vertigo or I get dizzy. Um, and if they have one-sided symptoms, they say, well, I have neck pain on this side or I have headache on this side, then I know that which side I should put the tube in. Um, this is a, a group of patients that um, I think was just recently published um, or it, uh, accepted. Uh, we had five patients who had purely pressure-sensitive vertigo and they resolved after PE tube, and then um, they came back with vertigo again, and every single one that came back, either the tube had been plugged or the tube had fallen out. And once we to put the tube back in or open the tube up, then their symptoms went away. Um, intratympanic steroids, I generally use if they, if they have um, failed medical therapy. We generally do an injection once every two weeks 
uh, we do up to four injections. Uh, as I said, I don't do endolymphatic surgery much, lax surgery, uh, because mo probably more than 98% of the time with medication and in steroid injections, we can get people better. So the very rare instances will do um, endolymphatic sac surgery. But if you do sac surgery, put a PE tube in for them and do steroids intraoperatively uh, for the patient. So migraine is really the primary cause of a vast majority of patients with vertigo. If patients have ear pressure or ear pain, their MRI is negative, they don't have any other problem, sudden hearing loss, recurrent acute or chronic quote unquote sinusitis, if they have pain in the forehead or in the ear, um, or one side, both sides, et cetera, think sinusitis. Uh, I'm sorry, think, I'm sorry, migraine instead of sinusitis. Um, the history is really important in this. I tell my residents, you should be able to diagnose migraine or diagnose vertigo on the phone because you should be able to get all the information on a history. Neck stiffness, motion sensitivity are very common things you'll see. You don't have to have a headache to have a migraine diagnosis. You can have other forms of migraine just like you can have just auras, just the, the vision problem, and that's called a migraine. So in the same way, you can have just ear symptoms and have a migraine. Uh, we treat the lifestyle and uh, changes and supplements first. Uh, we look for obstructive sleep apnea and treat it if necessary. And then you wanna learn to do the prophylactic uh, treatment and then uh, do that over time to get better at it. And I'll be happy to take any questions if you have any. Uh, thank you, Professor. It's uh, you're really uh, one of the best presentations I ever heard. And let me to tell you one of the reasons why I got very enthusiastic and I wanted you to present uh, this uh, excellent lecture to our uh, followers in the Facebook group and in um, social media, uh, because it's really, it's, it's, it's full of insight. I am in full agreement with all uh, you mentioned. I am a migrainer, migrainer myself from a migrainer family with all the family members. They have migraines since the age of three years. So I have a special experience and I see a lot. I was accused that I'm biased to overdiagnose the vestibular migraine because I'm not a surgeon. I don't do invasive procedures. I don't do a lot of intratympanic injection. I cannot do surgeries. So I first want to congratulate you for the very strong medical background uh, beside your surgical, outstanding surgical skills. And let's say to congratulate you about your courage to have thoughts which a uh, little bit contradict the current uh, uh, knowledge which is available. We have a lot of questions and uh, your uh, webinar have been attended by people from uh, like more than 20 countries, uh, different 20 countries. So what is the time left for questions, professors? Professor. Um, I have time. I have time. We can. I, I want to make sure we answer so, all the questions. So, so, we'll so uh, uh, we will take uh, 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 in order. We have like twenty questions. So just be uh, ready. Sure. So uh, it, there is. Let me to start by a question, which uh, uh, is a core in uh, this webinar. That is, uh, the literature always says that. Uh, uh, ANT tends to underdiagnose or mis, um, underdiagnose or neglect the vestibular migraine. Some other specialties they use the vestibular migraine as a, a, a waste basket. So all the patients they cannot reach a final diagnosis. They just label vestibular migraine, and the migraine by nature is very common in the population. It's in some reports it's up to 25 percent, especially in the female population. So, and I, I know a very known surgeon from the United States. He published a lot that all of patient labeled migraine, once he operated for a round window augmentation or superior canal disease, their headache and symptom disappeared. So he has a lot of uh, publication regarding this. So can you explain how you get such insight um, and how you clarify this conflict between uh, uh, in the current knowledge and uh, in uh, like between some other groups who published that most of the patient labeled vestibular migraine when they operated for perilymphatic fistula with round wound augmentation with severe canal dehiscence with uh, sac decompression surgery, they, their headache get better. 
So can you clarify this? Because this is very important, Professor. Sure, yeah. So um, it's a very good question. Um, I think the reason some uh, patients get better uh, from surgery is in the same way that uh, patients get better from surgery when they get sinus surgery and their headaches get better temporarily. Now, I, what I would like to see uh, from those authors is what are the, give me the long-term data on your patients. You know, short-term surgery because of a couple of reasons. One is some, a lot of times patients are given steroids after surgery or during surgery, or there is a steroid surge in the body from the uh, adrenal gland. And that steroid can settle that migraine process for a period of time. But if you follow these patients long enough, they will start developing symptoms again. Now, in the same way that you get the sinus surgery and their symptoms get better for a while, once everything kind of starts coming back to normal, like six months later, then their symptoms will come back. So be aware of patients who, the people who just present short-term data on surgery. Short-term, a lot of things look good. Long-term is really the question. Um, what what so is the I, long term I, for you? Two years, one year, six months? What is long no, term? No, one for one year. One year is enough uh, because the effects of surgery will then wear off within about six months. So if if I want to see long term, I one year it makes me happy. Now, um, you know the uh, the people a lot of times are some people who like to find surgical solutions to everything, um, and migraine is just not a surgical problem. Um, you know, can you do surgery? Yes, you can. Are you really helping the patient? Probably not. I mean, if you can tell the patient to eliminate caffeine and their problem goes away, why should we put them through the surgery? You know, um, I had a patient who is a uh, professional uh, dancer uh, last week, and he was so dizzy he couldn't actually dance anymore. He was a professional ballet dancer. And um, all that he needed was he had to eliminate this one kind of bread he was eating in the morning um, and the caffeine. And that is it. His vertigo has completely disappeared. So, you know, could I do a, a perilymph fistula repair? Um, and, you know, would that help the patient? It probably may be temporarily because the steroid surge will help them. But really, all he needed was just control of his diet and the sleep, et cetera. Um, so the, if you start seeing these patients and start treating them, you will start seeing the big difference you will make in the quality of life with very small changes in their life or with me, you know, uh, some medications. Do you want me to just run through the questions? I can just yes, read the question do. and answer them quickly. Professor, yeah. So the, uh, one question is, if it's caused by cortical spreading depression, why does it affect the trigeminal nerve often? Why not other nerves? Uh, and that's a very good question. I don't have a very good answer for it. I can tell you that the facial nerve is sometimes affected so that the patients who get... Um, the pedial myoclonus, or they get the twitching of the eyelids. Um, a lot of times, those are patients that respond to migraine uh, therapy. Um, a lot of times, they say it's sound-induced and things like that. So um, that we have a paper coming up about that topic, in fact. Next question is, do you think people with subjective vertigo without nystagmus are all vestibular migraine um, and or, or are some of them BPV? So, um, if somebody does not have nystagmus on Dick's Hall Pike, they probably don't have BPPB, um, and they're more likely to be migraine. Now, this is to be different. This is different from patients who get they feel they feel fine when you lie them back, but they sit up and they say, "I feel dizzy." That's of course from blood pressure. Um, immediate nystagmus with Dick's Hall Pike. Any specific nystagmus? No, you can see any type of nystagmus. Most commonly, the nystagmus lasts a lot longer than the uh, typical nystagmus of BPPV. So generally speaking, it lasts longer, but not always. Um, MDDS is treated with reverse optokinetic stimulation. The similar migraine is triggered by optokinetic stimulation. How do you relate the two findings? So keep in mind that migraine is a spectrum. And not everyone is the same. Um, there are people who are light sensitive with migraine. There are people who are not light sensitive with migraine. In the same way, there are people who are stimulated visually and some people who are not. But I can tell you that with our regimen of migraine prophylaxis therapy that was 
pretty easy to follow. And the lifestyle changes, we've been able to improve the patients much more than we were able to do with the, uh, the therapy that we did before. Ear fullness sensation in vestibular migraine is unilateral or always bilateral. Um, it's generally unilateral. It can be bilateral, but most commonly patients will say one side is more than the other side. Um, and generally speaking, that's the affected side, and this usually tends to be the same side they get headaches. Um, surprising to see such substantial uh, improvement after so many days and months from sudden hearing loss. Yes, we were surprised too. Uh, but when I started looking at it, I said, um, let's, uh, let's first look at, uh, let's, let's follow all the patients that we're going to do this to. And so, so far we have about 20 some patients and I, I gave you the results and a lot of them got better. I was surprised uh, too, but you know, not, I'm not surprised anymore because I see it happening all the time. How do you treat pediatric sudden sensor neural hearing loss? I generally treat the pediatric sudden sensor neural hearing loss with oral and sometimes if they can tolerate it, uh, intratympanic steroids. Um, I do uh, try a migraine prophylactic medication if depending on a lot of other factors, but the only one I use in children is amitriptyline. I will do a full workup uh, with labs uh, and of course an MRI because you don't want to just write it off as migraine in a child even though it most likely is. We'll still treat it as a migraine, but we will work up for autoimmune conditions um, uh, that could potentially lead up to it, like Wegner's and lupus and et cetera. Did all your patients with sudden hearing loss had history of headaches or were they diagnosed cases of migraine too? So about 70% of them, if I remember correctly, um, had a migraine history. Uh, no, I'm sorry, the sudden hearing loss was 56%, the acute sudden hearing loss. Um, if I remember correctly, but it was, it was high. It was more than 50%. Um, those were diagnosed. Now, a lot of them had features that are suggestive of migraine. Like they say, cold air hits my face and I get um, a headache, you know, that kind of thing. What is your treatment protocol for sudden sensory and oral hearing loss in COVID pandemic? Use steroid therapy anyway. Um, yes, I do talk to the patients. I tell them that there is a small risk uh, with steroids, but as long as they're careful, um, you know, and then they don't go out in the public and, and things like that, then I tell them that they'll probably be okay. Um, I give them the option of doing it in panic only if they want. Um, but I generally will do both. Um, it really depends on the patient. I, I should say that because of that the COVID problem, a lot of patients aren't coming to the doctor uh, on time. So uh, you'll probably see a lot of sudden loss patients that are late now. Is there any type of test result that you see most commonly in vestibular migraine patients? Um, I generally don't rely on tests for uh, diagnosis. I generally rely on the history. Um, and the next question is about VNG. So uh, VNG, I generally don't get uh, because VNG tends to make the patients very dizzy. And some patients, can, it can induce a migraine vertigo episode and they will have vertigo for a week or two. And I just don't feel like I get enough information out of the VNG to change what I was going to do clinically. So I always ask patients or other physicians, what do you do differently if there's a central finding on the VNG? Because you're gonna see two things, central finding, peripheral finding. Um, if you have a central finding, what are you gonna do differently? You're gonna still treat the migraine. What if there's a peripheral finding? What are you gonna do differently? you still have a problem that's creating acute vertigo and you still have to treat that. I'm still going to give them the migraine prophylactic medication. And then I will look at their caloric down the line to see if it's actually real or it is something that needs to be um, dealt with. But if the patient has no symptoms and they have a caloric asymmetry, what difference does it make? Why do I have to keep checking the caloric? Now, so I don't check it, but a lot of patients come to me, they've already had VNGs from other physicians. So the VNG, what I look at on the VNG is um, the abnormalities on the saccade and smooth pursuit. So a lot of times you'll see a uh, saccadic pursuit. So the pursuit, instead of being smooth, it's like, like this. Um, and uh, on the saccades, it, we can see sometimes 
uh, that the, the, the gaze stabilization, so stabilization of the vision is poor. So when they're supposed to keep their eyes still, it, it looks like this. It just goes up and down little, it looks like a fibrillation. So it looks like this instead of straight. That's what the most common things I see. You can see very high caloric numbers in some patients with migraine where they have numbers that are like 40, 50 um, on calorics. Or you can see very low numbers. And the very low numbers are usually all of the numbers are below 10. Now, that doesn't mean that they have like a complete loss of vestibular function. It a lot of times means that there's something occurring centrally that might be decreasing the peripheral input. And so I will generally still treat them the same way. Um, if there is concern, then I might repeat it down the line to show to see if the numbers are up. But if the patient doesn't have symptoms, once they're better with medications, then what's the purpose of getting a VNG? It really is to make us feel better, maybe. Um, topiramate is itself reported to cause significant depression. Your take on it. Um, topiramate is an, is an anti-seizure drug, and it's, um, anti-seizure drugs are a lot of times used in conjunction with antidepressants as a stabilizer of the patient's mood. Um, so it works really well when combined with the nortriptyline. I personally haven't seen topiramate causing uh, depression, and I have given it to hundreds and hundreds of patients. I rarely do see antidepressants making people, um, antidepressants making people uh, have depression, but I generally don't see topiramate, uh, I must say. Does oral and intratympanic, dose of oral and intratympanic steroid, please. So the dose I use for oral steroid is about one milligram to, per kilogram up to 80 milligrams. So 80 is the highest I go generally. I do that for one week and then I taper them over six to eight days. Um, the intratympanic steroid I use is dexamethasone 10 milligram per milliliter. Um, and it's important that you inject it I, correctly injection should be best done in the anterior superior quadrant so that you can fill up the entire middle ear. For 30 minutes, we have the patient sit there and not swallow. So um, I usually give them a suction like in the dentist's office. So they suction their saliva because if they swallow within five minutes based on the literature, that medicine is all gone from the middle ear and we really haven't done anything. So the way intratopanic steroid injection is done is very important. It's not just you just shoot it in and that's it. Um, and don't go in the posterior inferior quadrant as been described in the literature because most of the medicine will end up coming out. What is the role of diuretic in case of migraine of, or oral fullness? I generally don't use diuretics. Um, I mean, I should say that topiramate technically is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. So technically it has a little bit of a diuretic effect. And so is Diamox. Um, so I do use them, but um, I don't use hydrochlorothiazide much. Very rarely, if we have exhausted everything, I'll use it. Most of the patients I see have already seen other ENTs and they've already been tried on hydrochlorothiazide. So that's why I, I generally don't use it because it's already been tried. Uh, would you recommend hormone assessment for patients who had migraine vertigo prior to period or during? I, I will tell them that if their uh, vertigo or migraine is only triggered by hormonal changes, then they could consider, and I tell them to talk to their regular physician about it, a uh, birth control pill that makes their cycle once every three months rather than once every month. So they're making their vertigo once every three months rather than every month. So that's, that's what I recommend. Now, another option is a progesterone only uh, 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 my, uh, prophylactic or uh, contraceptive uh, medication. So um, a um, progesterone only is, will cause less of the uh, fluctuation. And so that's an option. And that would be either oral or there are like injectable ones. That's probably the best option first. And then if not, the other would be the every three month one. What is the physiology behind oversleeping triggering the migraine? Yeah, good question. I mean, nobody knows what, why sleep affects migraine. Um, it probably has to do with the brain's relaxation why is oversleeping do it? I, have, I, have, I don't have a good idea. But one thing I can tell you is that migraine brains like 
a very regimented life. They like the time to go to sleep at the same time, wake up the same, eat the same time, drink the same amount of water every day, no major ups and downs. It, it, the brain likes things in a steady thing every day on a schedule. Oversleeping tends to trigger it maybe because of that problem. Is there any role for flunarazine in vestibular migraine? Yes. Uh, flunarazine is a calcium channel blocker. We don't have it in the United States, um, uh, but uh, yes, you can use it and it works. Do you recommend these prophylactic medications also for BPV of childhood? In BPV of childhood, the most important thing is controlling the diet and sleep, because if you control those two things, generally the problem is solved. Now, I have patients who sometimes get triggered by going to like birthday parties and there's a lot of motion and noise and things like that. So I tell parents to sometimes where you have the, the child have earplugs or something. Uh, so that's the kind of thing um, I would do. I very, very rarely would use um, prophylactic medication in children uh, because I tell them you need to figure out what the trigger is because this child is going to have this condition for the rest of their life. So it's not like you can just give the medicine and the problem is going to go away that you haven't solved the problem. You need to solve the problem and that's identifying the trigger. And it, it actually works very well. So if you just do the, because kids generally don't have major stressors. If they do have stressors, then it needs to be addressed, but generally it's diet and sleep. Okay, any role for CGRP monoclonal antibodies? Um, yes, I think so. I mean, I had some patients who have gotten them uh, with their neurologist and they didn't get better, I must say. Um, so, you know, we haven't done a trial of it. We would actually, we want to start a trial of that. So we haven't done it yet. So I can't give you much information about it. Theoretically, it should work. Does it work in everybody? No, just like all the other medicines don't work for everybody. Um, let's see. Spending time with the patient and asking them in detail their lifestyle and diet makes changes is really will help a lot of patients. And that's correct. Yeah, I agree completely. Uh, any role of trigger point injection in treatment of vestibular migraine? Um, I generally stay away from trigger point injections and most commonly these would be for the neck because I tell the patient, we can, it's essentially a Band-Aid. You're, you're making the, the pain go away, but you're not making the migraine go away. And so the migraine really needs to be addressed by addressing the other uh, factors because that neck stiffness is part of the migraine. What regimen will you recommend for children under the age of 10? Um, just vitamin B2. Um, I usually, for children, younger children, I'll give a lower dose, like 100 milligrams or 50 milligrams twice a day, depending on the size of the child. And magnesium, between 100 and 200 milligrams twice a day. I do not use medications for children uh, that young. I mean, it would be an incredibly rare thing. Maybe in the last maybe 12, 13 years of uh, maybe there was one patient that I can think of um, that may have gotten medication. But it's generally the other stuff that we have to do. Um, let's see. Have you seen any chronic hearing loss recovered to baseline without migraine treatment? Um, I haven't seen significant chronic um, hearing loss. I'm talking about more than 30 decibel. Um, I have seen milder levels of loss recover to baseline. Um, so people who have like a 20 decibel or 15 decibel low frequency, um, yes, I've seen them. But a long-term significant loss, I have not seen, um, a, a, you know, a, a return to normal. Can you get some improvement? Yes, I think, you know, migraine is a fluctuating condition, so you can potentially. Um, but I think based on the numbers that we see of a significant improvement in the, in the group that we saw, we think that it's more than just um, recovery on its own. Um, can we get confused migraineous vertigo and cerebellar function issues? So cerebellar function is primarily, think of cerebellar function as movement disorders. So these are patients who are going to have, um, you know, a um, intention tremor in their hands or feet, um, you know, rapid alternating motion. Um, generally, they don't get vertigo from having a cerebellar issue. You could get it from a brainstem issue, but not a cerebellar issue. How do you explain the efficacy of Botox in treating migraine? So Botox works primarily for headaches. I haven't seen it work for uh, vertigo, I must say. Um, maybe beyond a, 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 a placebo effect. But 
The reason uh, that pain uh, gets better is because the supraorbital nerves uh, and supratrochlear nerves are oftentimes the triggers. And so when there's pain there, it causes spasm of the frontalis and the corrugator. And that then causes more pressure on the nerve that's already been sensitized, and that causes more pain. So by relaxing those muscles, you're actually improving um, the patient's symptoms by really reducing the pressure on the nerve. There's still a lot of times are actually getting migraines. They just may not manifest the headaches as much anymore. So they'll say patients, I got, I got Botox, my headaches got better, but I still have the dizziness. Are beta histine contraindicated in vestibular migraine? Um, no, and I should say that I don't have much experience with beta histine, partly because beta histine is not available in the United States. It's not approved for use. Uh, there, are, there are some people who do use it. Um, why does it work? I'm not really sure why it works. Uh, but there are patients uh, who say that it works for them. Um, so, you know, I, they, they tend to get it from either Canada or from special pharmacies. Vestibular migraine model and animal studies, any update or connections? No, but we're actually working on, on developing such a model. Medications given during pregnancy and lactation? Yeah, very good question. And uh, it's a very tough one. The only thing we can give during pregnancy and Lactation is magnesium. Unfortunately, because of hormonal changes, poor sleep, um, it, that tends to be the biggest triggers for those, especially during lactation and, and late pregnancy. Um, so it, it's a tough one. And, and other than magnesium, we don't have much to offer. Um, let's see. Do often do MRI uh, to rule out other causes for vestibular migraine. Yes, I actually get a, a, an MRI on probably everyone because in the United States, there are a lot of people who um, will file lawsuits against doctors for missing little things. And so I just don't want to have to worry about that. So we order an MRI on all the vertigo patients. Um, if they've had a previous vertigo, uh, previous, I'm sorry, MRI in the last five years, I ask them to bring me the MRI. I will look at it. And then if it looks fine, then I don't order another one. Uh, any relationship between noise-induced hearing loss, tinnitus, and migraine? So noise-induced hearing loss, um, not, not with migraine, but tinnitus and migraine are actually very much interrelated. Um, so people who come in and they say um, they have uh, some times of the day, the tinnitus gets louder and sometimes it's quieter. So the fluctuating tinnitus, is a migraine-related phenomenon. Um, and treating migraine in those patients, we have a paper coming up hopefully soon um, on this topic of treating patients with fluctuating tinnitus. We're in fact doing a clinical trial on it right now. Um, so yes, uh, there is definitely a relationship between tinnitus and migraine, but not noise-induced hearing loss that I know of. Is there any difference between managing vestibular migraine and basal migraine? No, uh, the same, same treatment applies. Topiramate and memory loss, what is your opinion? Yeah, it's a good, good question. So topiramate can cause some short-term uh, memory issues in some patients. At, at the highest doses, so around 200 milligrams, which I generally don't go to 200, I generally stop at 150. Um, but uh, at 150, still about maybe 5 to 7% of the patients can have short-term memory issues. So if people are public speakers, so like they're attorneys or doctors or uh, teachers, then I generally try to stay away from topiramate as my first option because of that, um, what we call word finding difficulty. So they, they're talking and they just can't think of the word, you know, like sometimes like I do when I'm talking, but a lot worse. Um, so I generally stay away from it for those, but it doesn't cause any chronic issues. So somebody who's on it, they're off of it, their, their memory issues could go away. And it's just word finding difficulty and short-term memory, not a long-term memory problem. Are tinnitus and headaches temporarily related in vestibular migraine patients? They can be. Um, and so tinnitus exacerbation related to migraine tends to be really from the hypersensitivity of the brain rather than hearing loss. So it's not that their hearing is going down, it's that their uh, symptoms are getting worse because migraine makes the brain more sensitive and pays more attention to the tinnitus signal. The topiramate daily um, or every other day. I generally use it every day. Uh, topiramate is a very short-acting medication. Ideally, it's given BID, um, but because of the short-term memory issues it can create, 
I generally use it only at night. Um, and so the peak of the blood level is during the night when they're sleeping, so it doesn't cause as much problems during the day. But there are patients where I'll spread it to twice a day or even sometimes three times a day. Um, and that reduces the, the side effects significantly. The only other side effect we see probably commonly with topiramate is tingling around the lips or the fingers um, because it is like diamox, a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. Any other questions? I have a question, Professor. If, if you uh, yes. finish all, let me to ask my question. Go ahead. So uh, my question is, uh, you know, that is, uh, it was reported clearly that vestibular migraine is coma, it can be associated with Meniere's disease with concomitant incidence up to 50% of the Meniere's cases. So, and the Barani Society recommendations that if you have concomitant Meniere's disease and vestibular migraine, uh, you treat as Meniere's disease. So what's your uh, opinion about this? Um, yes, and I actually was part of the um, our American Academy of Otolaryngology um, uh, committee that reviewed the Barony Society, um, and I must say I disagreed with it, um, and I said that um, that actually migraine should be treated first, and that you need to rule out. But unfortunately, um, you know, the, I'm, I'm the only one on the committee. If you're the only one or only one of a couple of people, who, um, it, it's all by majority. So um, I would say that I disagree. And my experience has been that uh, if you treat the migraine, the, the Meniere's symptoms go away. Now, could you treat it as a Meniere's and just give them prophylactic, you know, diuretic for six weeks? Sure, you could do that. And if they don't get better, then I would switch to the migraine, um, you know. You, you lose six weeks, that's it. But I wouldn't do surgery without trying migraine medications. And what about the use of uh, Diamox? Because in uh, those cases in our clinic, first the choice if, uh, if we have concomitant venereal disease and uh, vestibular migraine, it's always Diamox is our first choice because it can work for both. So uh, what, what's your experience about this? Yeah, very good uh, Yeah, question. Yeah, and, and Diamox, um, it really actually was, is, is an, as a carbonic anhydrase, it's its anti-seizure drug. It lowers intracranial pressure and um, it, uh, it's used very much for a, a specific type of migraine called hemiplegic migraine. It's the uh, drug of choice for that. So you could use Dimox and it, it's fine, but you know, if you're really giving Dimox, you're really treating the migraine in reality. That's what I was trying to say. So shift in frequency tuning of VEMP is an indication of Meniere's disease and vestibular migraine concomitance. Does treatment of vestibular migraine take away the endolymphatic hydrops sign frequency tuning shift of VEMP? Uh, it's a good question. I have not done testing before and after uh, with VEMP. I generally only get VEMP testing to look for superior canal dehiscence or other canal dehiscence. So I generally don't get it for, uh, for these patients. Um, so I, I don't have an answer to your question, but I can tell you that when they've done studies of uh, trying to look for a test that can set apart migraine and Meniere's disease, no one has been able to, to come up with a test that can tell the two apart. And it's probably because the two are probably caused by the same thing. Long, uh, and then one question was, should we stop to pyramid if it causes numbness? No, it's just, you know, you have to maybe spread the dose. Um, that might be the best way to help it. Um, Long-term use of levetiracetam and migraine and memory loss, any relationships? Um, so I haven't used much of the levetiracetam um, for migraine. Um, I've used it only on a couple of patients recently, and that's just because we've tried everything else and they were sensitive or they couldn't take it or things like that, mostly because they were sensitive to medications. Um, any problems with memory loss? If, you know, anti-seizure drugs all can cause memory issues. Um, and so memory issues are generally temporary though. It's not a long-term problem. So if you stop the medication, the problem goes away. If you spread the medication, lower the dose, that problem goes away. Any other questions? And the animal studies, um, again, it was another question about animal models there. I, 
we are working on one, but I, I don't know of a robust animal model yet. Um, if Meniere's disease symptoms and headache, should they treat it for, treat it for vestibular migraine? That's what I would do, and that's what I would recommend. Um, you know, I, I can't dictate, you know, how people do things. Um, but I would recommend treating the migraine first. And oftentimes, you will see that Meniere's disease symptoms will get better. Um, my partner here, neuro neurotology partner, he came out of his training, you know, uh, treating Meniere's disease. And I said, try nortriptyline first. And, you know, he started trying it and now that's all he does um, because he found it to work so well. But you just have to try these things uh, and on enough patients and you'll see the results. So, again, I wanted to thank you, uh, Professor for the invitation and um, all of the uh, audience members from all over the world. And I'm very honored uh, to be speaking to you guys and uh, answer your questions. Feel free to email me um, if you have questions that um, I have a, a handout and the medication regimen I can send you. You forward you to like. me, we, uh, we have a more community professor. So let's, uh, we have 22,000 followers in our Facebook wow. uh, community. So I think everybody will learn. I, I, I got the hands out before, but please uh, send to my email. I will forward to the 22,000 vestibular professionals from all over the world. So uh, because your presentation and your own book is really a practice changing. And uh, it's uh, like uh, it changes the philosophy how people deal with a very, very common condition in the practice. So I am very advocate to, uh, to all of what you have mentioned and what you said. And really I want everybody just to uh, get benefit from uh, those uh, very insightful input and the practice changing. This is the most important. I have similar experience to you. I'm in a referral center. I got all the second or third opinion cases. So most of all these revisions, it comes out that uh, vestibular migraine was not treated at all. So I, in our experience, we fully agree with you and we would like everybody to uh, learn and get benefit from this and that's how it just uh, forward to my email, I will put in our Facebook uh, community, Professor, and I cannot find where this, uh, to thank you for uh, your um, acceptance for the invitation, for your outstanding lectures, and I'm sure you can see the feedback, and the most likely will be posting this in our YouTube channel, so more people uh, get benefit because uh, it has a very valuable message, uh, Professor. And we'll be honored to have you a faculty in our coming vestibular diploma, which uh, uh, we try our best to just, just uh, to, uh, uh, to prepare the clinicians very well to be uh, able to confidently and uh, correctly um, handling and treating and diagnosing the disease patients. So uh, thank you very, very, very much, Professor. We appreciate and it was an honor. And this is one of the best uh, lectures I have attended uh, personally. And I think it's uh, one of the top lectures in our activities. Thank you very much. Those are very, very kind words. I really appreciate it. Uh, I really appreciate the invitation and I would be happy to share uh, the information uh, with you. I'll send it to you afterwards. Thank you everybody for, uh, for all the audience from different parts of the world. And please be tuned for our coming soon vestibular online diploma. Thank you everybody and goodbye. Bye-bye.